So welcome. Uh, thank you uh, to the host for giving us the platform to convene uh, this dialogue, uh, this engagement, where we are looking at the importance of the of transforming smallholder irrigation uh, schemes, uh, so it, so that we build that uh, climate resilience of farming systems in Africa. And uh, so we have an interesting lineup today. Uh, for our discussions. Um, we are going to also take you through the program just in a bit, but just a few housekeeping issues uh, to take note of. We have uh, interpretation. Uh, so for those that uh, uh, prefer Portuguese, or English, please uh, go down to the bottom of the, uh, of the platform of the page and you can choose uh, the language of choice there, your preferred language. And also the chat box is open for us to introduce ourselves uh, and as well as share questions and comments as we progress with the, uh, the meeting. You will get an opportunity uh, at a later stage um, uh, after the speakers and panelists have shared perspectives to also come in uh, with a, via the chat box again or uh, you can raise your hand and we will uh, be able to uh, give you a chance to uh, share your perspective. So just uh, going through the program. Um, so we're starting now at 9.30, we should be done by 11.30. This is uh, uh, South African time, uh, but I know that we're coming from different parts of the world, which is really uh, the beauty of uh, having such platforms that bring together uh, different people in the comfort of their offices or their homes uh, and hope we have uh, great deliberations here. Taking note of the fact that uh, these discussions are fitting into uh, the bigger uh, discussions, we need to come up with the um, call to action at the end of the day uh, for COP27. And so let's keep that in mind as we are going to be um, starting our session. So an overview of our program. So we've got uh, Dr. Theo Di Yeager, the FANAPAN board chair. Well, he's actually the uh, former uh, World uh, Farmers uh, World Farmers Organization president, uh, and he's going to deliver the opening remarks. We've got uh, Dr. Veronica Dor. Uh, from ASEA, our partners that have been with us through our through implementing uh, several projects, uh, but uh, making sure that we have uh, interventions that are sustainable, that we make a, 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 a an important uh, transformation in the lives of the people on the ground. We will have uh, the setting of the scene. This is the keynote presentation. That will be delivered by Dr. Andre, who is from ICRISAT, but also a key uh, investigator in the TISA project. We'll get more, we'll learn more about the TISA project that has been implemented in the Southern African region um, a bit more. Uh, and my core facilitator, Tembi, is going to take us through the past panel discussions. We've got a great lineup there in the panel. Uh, session and we are uh, excited that we will get those perspectives and that will help us also uh, in terms of our Q&A session. We'll get um, uh, the, the, the next steps towards the end uh, from Jamie, who is the principal investigator of the project that we've been implementing, the TISA project, uh, towards the end, and then the closing remarks from uh, Dr. Chilidzi Matsuandila, the FANAPAN CEO and head of mission. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and would like to, um, I know that we've had a bit of a challenge with the, uh, the logging in, the registration. Some of my colleagues have had that challenge. Uh, so I'm hoping that all the panelists and all the speakers uh, manage to then uh, filter in and get into the meeting. Uh, so in case there's someone who's still trying to uh, figure out the system, uh, we'll have to uh, maybe go to the next person and then uh, get back to them at a later stage. Uh, 
with that said, I would like to invite our board chair, board chair for Fanapan, Dr. Theo uh, Diego, to deliver the opening remarks. Uh, Kanto, uh, just let me know if. Uh, um, Dr. Noni, all the speakers are here. I accept uh, Dr. Theo Diago. I think okay. he's still, yeah. You still feel getting it out. No, no worries. Okay, then that's great. Uh, I see uh, Veronica is uh, smiling there uh, all the way from Australia. Uh, so we're really excited to have you join us, uh, Veronica. I know that you've specialized in climate change as well, and this is a great platform to discuss this and take you know those key messages to the next phase where our global leaders will be making our calls and uh, you know we want to feed into that process and this is a great platform to do that. Um, so over to you to share some welcome remarks, Veronica. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyoni, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening here in Australia to everyone. Um, it really is a great pleasure to, to welcome you and, and to be part of this dialogue. Um, I've been asked to give the, the welcome remarks, but I tend to think this is a great opportunity to, to kind of set the stage, to talk about why I think this particular dialogue is so important. Um, so, so yes, my name is Veronica Dorr. Um, I lead the Climate Change Program at the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, or ACR. Um, and the, the program was only established um, two years ago with a focus specifically on transformation. So I think the dialogue around transformation is really essential. I work very closely with our new leader for our water program, Neil Lazaro. He's continuing to support this important work that we're talking about today. Um, travel just prevented him from, from being with you today, but I know he's very sad about that. Uh, but I'm very glad that I get to represent ACR here. Uh, I do want to, to express my support for and deep thanks to, um, to the, the regional resilience hubs um, and the, particularly obviously the African regional resilience hub organizers and the organizers of the event today. This really is a great way to involve more local people in the conversations that shape the evolving directions of, of climate response across the globe. And to me, that's really what COP and all of the pre-COP events are about. We're all moving so fast, trying to figure out what to really focus on, you know, what we've what we've kind of not done very well in the past, what we need to do better going forward. And, and the more voices we have in that dialogue, the, the better the, the overall directions we'll, we'll get will be. Now I'm I'm really happy that to me, when I when I look at all the, those discussions around COP and in the lead up COP events. Um, we're starting to see them go much more beyond kind of simple assumptions that people really used to have. So it, it used to be that you would see lots of agricultural projects that said they were about resilience, but they were really just about improving yield or improving income. Now, those sorts of things can build resilience, but they don't necessarily always. Resilience really is the capacity to change as the world around you changes ever faster at the moment. And we're seeing much more nuanced understanding of that. And a more really specifically skilled global community um, that, that really has been educated in many ways by, by grassroots experiences. It means that we're getting more sophisticated conversations. And I, and I think this is gonna be one of those today. So I see that there are two key assumptions that uh, have been made in the past that the conversation today will help to challenge and will really help to take forward at COP. So the first assumption I, I think we're going to be challenging here is that if water is the problem, then water management is the solution. So we all know water is one of the, the most tangible ways in which we're directly experiencing climate change, water scarcity, water overabundance, um, all, all those changes in seasonality. Um, but water is really a connector. It links so many elements of our systems, humans and human health and the natural environment and agriculture in all kinds of ways. So, so the solutions often aren't just about how we manage water alone. 
And the previous assumption has kind of been that, well, you know, if there's a if there's water scarcity coming our way, we just need to find more water. But that's not necessarily been successful, and it certainly won't be possible as climate change deepens. So the work that you're going to be hearing about today, it it it, it delved into the fact that you, you know we can actually use information availability um, as part of the, the water solutions. So using soil water and nutrient monitoring tools gave farmers the, themselves an easy ability to detect when they really needed to use water. And therefore it wasn't about more water, it was about smarter use of water with the right information combined with smarter management of nutrients. And so that's a great kind of little systems package. And I've heard that, that farmers in Tanzania have actually then reduced the time they spend irrigating by 65%. So then that time savings actually becomes an enabler of further adaptation action. Um, so, so I think we can really explore a little bit more around these packages of solutions or systems of solutions. The second assumption that I've seen in, in the past that, that this work in particular is really gonna be challenging right now is that top-down policy and finance enables local solutions. We all know that not enough of the climate finance is really reaching the ground, reaching the people who need it. I think last year, the figure quoted was something like 7% of all climate finance actually reaches the ground, which is just a shocking statistic. So increasingly, that is a very big conversation at top. How does climate finance reach the ground? And, and alongside that, we've seen a big movement in locally led adaptation. So it's not just about the finance reaching the ground, it's about local leaders being able to decide what's right for them, what they really need. And, and local ownership, that local ability to put in place the solutions yourselves is actually very enabling of resilience. If we need to be able to change faster as the conditions around us change, we need to have local empowerment, not wait for the next GCF project, which might be years down the line to be able to, to come meet us on the ground. And that's one of the big things that, that the transforming smallholder irrigation has been about. It's been about transforming it such that smallholders themselves have the tools and the power to make it happen. Now that's very much what ACR is about. Um, we're, we're brokers, enablers, and funders of, of research for development in agriculture and livelihoods, but with a very strong focus on benefit for smallholder farmers. Um, and that makes us perfectly suited to working with the locally led adaptation agenda. So what I'm really interested to see now is, is you know, we're going to have a dialogue today that emphasizes that, that, that success, if you will, of putting the tools in the hands of locals and, and the, the kind of proof of concept that that can transform smallholder irrigation. But now the question has been transformation at a continental scale. How do we really scale out locally led solutions? And there's been a real tension there in the COP dialogues. If everything has to be locally tailored and locally designed and locally led, how do we make that happen over large scales very quickly? Uh, I think partnerships are absolutely essential to that, and, and that's, um, that's a, an invaluable role that many of our organizers here today play. Um, organizations like FANAPAN and the CDKN um, and even South South North um, are very much about uh, forging those partnerships. But I'm really looking forward to seeing how the dialogue today digs in to that question of how do we actually rapidly scale locally led solutions. And I know we're, we're gonna hear some wonderful ideas today. So thank you very much for inviting me here to do a bit of a welcome. And, um, and, and I really can't wait to hear what you all have to say. Enjoy the dialogue. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Veronica. Uh, thanks for those remarks. Um, and for that preamble, uh, giving us a picture of what uh, the interventions interventions that have been done so far and the big questions and assumptions that we need to be dealing with and addressing here 
and in this COP, COP2017. So thank you so much for that preamble. I think it takes us very, it, it gives us a, a very good basis to get into the next phase uh, where then Andre is now unpacking in detail what the interventions with the support uh, uh, from ACIA, uh, the interventions that we have uh, done or implemented on the ground and to show the results that have come up from there. And I think that that's a perfect time for, uh, for Andre to be coming in now. Thank you so much again for that. Andre, the floor is yours. Uh, so Andre is going to uh, set the scene. And uh, basically here, uh, he's uh, unpacking how we can uh, transform mitigation schemes in Africa, because there is that gap that is really a glaring gap in terms of addressing those challenges with irrigation schemes. Uh, and uh, we need the input and uh, uh, the participation from the locals in terms of making sure that we have that greatest impact. Andre. Um, uh, Thank you very much. If you could stop sharing, then I can share my screen. Okay. Okay, I assume everybody can, can see my screen. And thank you very much for, for allowing us to, to talk. And Veronica, uh, thank you very much for, for such a wonderful introduction to, uh, to the work that we've done. And yes, we are, we are all very, very excited about it. Uh, I can just... Great. So the question is, how do we transform irrigation schemes? And... And my my pet hate in the research and development world is is always the the search for for silver bullets which which don't exist and and this slide uh, essentially suggests that there are uh, multiple intervention points and and many places where we where we need to intervene in in systems. So our first sort of point of intervention was so-called innovation platforms or areas where, where we work with multiple stakeholders uh, to determine their objectives, their ideas, what they want from the system uh, and, and where, where their aspirations lie. The, the tools that Veronica referred to, I'll, I'll talk about them uh, in, in a moment, but yeah, it's essentially sharing information about uh, water and nutrients uh, that would then help farmers to make proper decisions or more informed decisions about their production systems so that they, on the far right, they can engage in, in the markets uh, and not only manage water better, but uh, the markets is, is what drive the incentive frameworks for, for farmers. So <clears throat> this is a pretty complex slide, but it essentially illustrates that we, we had four main sort of intervention areas. Uh, it, it revolves around the soil and monitor, soil water and nutrient monitoring tools that provide information uh, that improves production uh, around markets and also uh, engaging with, with policies. But, but let, me, let me go on very quickly and, and illustrate one of the most powerful ways in which to engage with systems is to give the real people on the ground uh, an audience to articulate, as in this case, uh, where we developed visions around irrigation schemes. This is in Zimbabwe, Silala, China, where we asked farmers uh, to draw us these rich pictures of what do the, the irrigation scheme look like now? The, the physical side, the agricultural side, the human side, the economic side, what are the challenges uh, that they see, and then on the right, where would they like to be in five years from now or from then? What are their aspirations? And, and this is often where you get the real buy-in from communities to begin to make real systemic changes, because we're not only increasing yields or profitability, we're also improving infrastructure, the flow of information, et cetera, et cetera. 
and this is the kind of way that I that I see that transformation takes place. So back to the tools that, that came from Australia, we use the, the wetting front detector that that measures uh, or that you can use to, to detect where the water fronts are. Uh, but more importantly, you can then extract the water from different depths uh, in the soil. And the idea is here to illustrate to farmers how much of their very expensive fertilizers are flushed beyond the root zone. In other words, uh, it's unavailable to the plant. So the idea here is that you want to keep the test strips as purple as possible in the shallow wetting front detector and as white as possible in the deep one so that you do not flush your nutrients. And this is a very, very important piece of information to make farmers understand what happens when you, when you over irrigate. Together with this is the so-called chameleon. Uh, the farmers call it the chameleon because it changes colors depending on the environment. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, device uh, developed and refined by uh, Richard Sturziker from CSIRO in, in Australia. Uh, but the, the cool thing about this, this tool is that uh, it's technically very, very complicated, but the interface is very simple for farmers to use. And this is the, the critical thing here is that farmers hold the tools in their own hand they measure soil moisture at different depths, close to the surface, within the root zone, and again beyond the root zone, and they can see where the new, where the, the moisture in the soil is. So often in the beginning, farmers ask us, so when do we do what? What are the rules? And we always said to them, there are no rules, you define your own rules. When they ask how deep you plant the sensors, we said, it depends on your crop, where are the roots? So it's a learning tool for farmers to begin to think about water in their, in their system. But beyond that, you can also measure the, the, obviously the nitrates, as, as I've said, uh, and then the electric conductivity that tells you a lot about salinity in the soil. But we sort of get these maps of how wet or how blue the, the fields are, and you can see that there's a huge amount of water in this in this system. Uh, and as farmers begin to experiment and learn, uh, they turn the data into information, and then information into knowledge, and essentially later on that turns into wisdom that makes them adjust the, the number of siphons they use, how often they irrigate, how long they irrigate, so through this cycle of, of learning, farmers uh, integrated the information and the data they got from the, from the tools uh, with regards to soil moisture and nutrients, and they learned and adjusted the, the, the frequency and the amount of water that they, that they used. This is uh, two graphs from Sila, from Makoba and Sila China. So let's just look at the one on the right. Uh, this is the water productivity. In other words, the kilograms of maize produced by cubic meters of water. The, the light graph is the amount of maize produced with a cubic meter of water before the project. The dark one on the right is after the project. So you'll see an incredible increase in the water productivity of those farmers who have tools installed in their fields. The middle graph is the one that really fascinates me because those are the increases in water productivity of the farmers who did not own tools, but who learned from those who with tools uh, and adjusted their own behavior uh, through learning. So that's, that's a, a very important uh, concept when we start talking about scaling is, is also learning because we cannot give every farmer in Africa a set of tools, uh, but we can begin to understand to what extent learning takes place. So what was the, the impact of this? Again, let's just focus for, for time's sake on Sila Lachani in the, on the right. You'll see that there are farmers who, who reported that they had reduced yields and income, but the majority of farmers uh, reported increases in, in yields and income uh, 
as much as 25, 50%, and even more than 50, 75%, and a small proportion of farmers indicated that their yields have doubled and so at their income. So there are significant improvements in, in the system in terms of yield and, and income. The important thing that that we need to look at is what are the incentives for this? Because often we as agriculturalists, we like to look at yields and income and then we stop there. But the importance for farmers is what do they do with that income and how do that change their lives? And uh, I don't have time to talk about multidimensional poverty here, but you'll see that education, farmers are able to spend more money on, on, on farming inputs. In other words, they can, they can improve their, their production systems through more inputs. They can pay for education, which for farmers are, are incredibly handsome incentives to work with. If you can increase the amount of money you spend on your children's education and food and infrastructure and that sort of stuff. So really understanding what are the impacts of these systems are, are, are really important to understand the incentive frameworks for why farmers would adopt these, these technologies. One of the things that, that we noticed was that uh, farmers often told us that they experienced decreases in, in conflict, uh, both at, at the, uh, within the household, because if you have more money to pay for food and construction and paying the school fees, there were less friction between mom and dad in the household, but also less friction between farmers uh, between the different blocks within irrigation schemes, and then also, uh, very importantly, reductions in conflict between the scheme itself and, and other water, water users. In Tanzania, we saw significant decreases uh, in conflict between irrigations up and downstream because more water was available. So trying to, to wrap up what was happening here is that we had... Uh, learning from the tools that changed some biophysical ways in which water and nutrients flowed in the system that obviously had big impact on the production system on on the right farmers were able to to increase the nutrient pool they were flushing less nutrients down the soil profile they increased yields because the innovation platforms also linked them to good markets they had more uh, income uh, which meant they could they could purchase more inputs they could uh, pay for all the 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 food education and and increase farming inputs so this is the kind of systemic way in which we as system scientists try to look at systems and how to bring uh, systemic change and the emphasis here is that you need multiple entry points to bring about systemic change there are no silver bullets you, you need to intervene in these systems in, in multiple places. This is a, a very simple diagram of how we achieved that by, if you look at on the left, most often farmers were uh, the people in the arena and everybody shouted instructions from the outside. But with the innovation platforms, we bring all the, all the role players to within the, the innovation platform, we create those linkages uh, and strengthen the networks between all the actors so that everybody can begin to see what their role and impact is. And another way of, of illustrating this is that if you look at the, the networks around irrigation systems or agriculture and strengthening those networks and the flow of information within things like, or multiple stakeholders, uh, like the uh, like innovation platforms, you can change the behavior on the ground and the way nutrients and water and products and information and, and ultimately dollars can flow through these systems. And too often we, we want to work at the bottom of this, but I think working with the, with the institutions, the farmers, the stakeholders, the markets, we can create very, very complex interactions at, at lower levels. And this is something that, that I think we've learned from, from this work in TISA over the last 10, 11 years, uh, is that the, the, the people are the strongest entry points to, to generate change in the way people manage resources. So I spoke a lot about entry points and I'm almost done. 
this is some wonderful work done by Donella Meadows on, on where are the entry points in systems. And quite often we work at the weakest end with the parameters within systems. We look at how much water is being pumped, what are the taxes, what are the, the, the buffers, can we build the irrigation scheme stronger? Can we make the night storage dams bigger? Uh, but when you move down to look at what are the feedbacks in these systems? What happens when you put good information into the system? Uh, what are the feedbacks when people begin to understand that they are flushing nutrients? So they begin to, to reduce their, their water use. What happens that if you link them to good markets, the feedback from the increased incomes from markets is what, what strengthens those that learning. Uh, and then when you get to the design of the system where people begin to realize that, that we, we can structure the information flows ourselves, we can begin to, to work positively with uh, irrigation management committees to change the rules of not sending the water down the canals every week, but only send it down the canals when we need it. So in the past, those rules were, were very strict and, and well enforced, but with the feedback mechanisms between producers and irrigation management committees, they were able to change the rules of the system because and the point number four there, they were able to self-organize. So farmers had the agency to begin to change the rules uh, and to eventually the very strong entry points, the goals of the system. So one of the, the things that we've seen in, in numerous of these uh, irrigation schemes is that farmers had their own transition or mental models of change from being subsistence farmers to, to market oriented. And then in, in Zimbabwe and in, in other schemes, we've seen that even the governance systems have transcended their paradigms. In Zimbabwe, the director of irrigation declared after seeing some of this work that I don't care what farmers are growing as long as they make money. Whereas in the past, the, the paradigm was you got to grow food crops uh, and maize and, and wheat, which are not uh, very profitable. So the point here is that my gut feel is, and talking to people like Jamie and other people within the project is, we need to intervene at least at three or four of these levels to, to bring about the, the systemic change. Uh, that starts off with a very good theory of change and I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through this, but this is all published in, in, in many of our papers, which are freely available online is, you gotta have a good theory of change uh, and then once you have a good theory of change, you have to be able to adjust that, monitor it and see how the system is responding to your multiple leverage points, uh, adjust your theory of change and make sure that, that everybody who's working with you are, are in line. The last point I wanna make is a very quick one around the science of discovery versus the science of delivery. So often we want to, we want to engage in developing systems or uh, improving irrigation schemes, in this case with reductionist science. And there we as researchers and people in the research and development fraternity need to make the transition that yes, the science of discovery or reductionist science is really great to understand systems, but you cannot directly apply that science to build systems. And the science of delivery is what I think the next frontier is because it's all about the relationships and the holes and the circularity of, of nutrients, water, information, and cash, and how we bring those things together to build systems uh, using on developing this, this, what I really like to, to refer to as the, the science of delivery. How do we make things happen? So with that, I'll just go through two very quick slides of two uh, special issues that, that we've published. So there's a large number of, of papers that, that you can access to, to look at this work. And then the final thing is uh, ACR has kindly uh, extended our funding for us to, to really evaluate the climate smartness of this work. And some of the, the preliminary results here are, are very, very uh, encouraging that we, we are 
using a lot less water, we are able to quantify it. Uh, we are leaching a lot less nutrients into underground waters. Uh, we are sequestering a lot of carbon and reducing other greenhouse gases through more efficient management of, of water and, and nutrients. So with that, uh, that is 12 years work in, in 15 minutes and I appreciate your, your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, uh, that's quite intriguing. Uh, I think the, the results from this intervention uh, is very uh, encouraging to see the different entry points in terms of transforming the system. And uh, I, I think that uh, core development part, rather than that top-down approach where we have interventions and we have solutions, uh, we need to engage with the people on the ground, uh, the people that are affected by the, the challenges that we have. We need to build the resilience of the target population of our African communities. Uh, the communities have to be part of the decisions so that there's that buy-in, there's, uh, um, there's that ownership of the, the, the solutions. And I think that's one of the critical uh, parts that we've enjoyed um, uh, in this project uh, or implementing these interventions is that there's been that flexibility to learn as well in the process while um, trying to solve the challenges that we're seeing on the ground. There's that learning process as well. And uh, uh, we've seen the results uh, impacting and changing the lives of the people on the ground. And that's what we want. And we want that sustainability of such interventions. Thank you so much, Andre for that. Um, we will like to take pictures. Um, Sylvester uh, is here, Sylvester, my colleague is here. So uh, before we get to the panel discussion, if uh, everyone could uh, smile a bit and uh, um, say resilience, um, turn on their videos, and we take uh, um, the new ways of taking pictures these days. So. Um, we would have been going for a tea break right now, having a bit of finger foods, but uh, yeah, for a later stage. I hope everyone is there. Sylvester, could you help us uh, with, the, with the pictures? Oh, I see, I see the smiles. Okay, that's great. Um, oh, wonderful. Kanto, Sylvester, please uh, uh, take us through the, the pictures. Are you guys done? Should we be yes, smiling almost. more? Yes, almost. We have quite the numbers of participants. So okay. uh, we, should, yeah. should we be smiling? Yeah, thank you everyone for keeping that beautiful smile. We are done in just a second. Thank you. Yes, we're done. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so we a pivot now and transition to the panel discussions. And I'm handing over the reins to my colleague, uh, Tembi, who is uh, the, the director for policy research and analysis. Um, so Tembi, over to you uh, with our panel discussion. Thank you, Njo. Um, and thank you to um, Andre for the presentation and Veronica for the, for the interventions. I think some really interesting points that have come out from the two, um, from Veronica's sort of setting the scene remarks and from Andre's presentation. Um, I, 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 there's a question in the group from uh, Samti asking where was this work taking place and Andre has responded there. But also just to, to say that whilst the work is focusing in Zimbabwe, Tanzania and Mozambique, what this platform here is doing is presenting us with an opportunity to actually expand the discussion around the importance of transforming smallholder irrigation schemes beyond just the three countries that we have been looking at, but also looking at how can uh, improving irrigation be part of efforts to build climate resilient farming systems right across the, the continent. So right now I will be joined by um, some esteemed colleagues who will um, share a few of their, um, of, of, of their thoughts around what it takes to transform irrigation systems 
in Africa. We have heard from the TISA project what has been done, what has been achieved, uh, but we want to look at grassroots irrigation. We want to look at ambitions versus reality. And we also want to look at key gaps and opportunities, in, especially in the context of the current climate change discussions and also looking at what's going to be happening at COP27 in Egypt later on this year. So I am joined by Ms. Mary Sakala, who is from the Eastern and Southern African Farmers Forum. I think it's really important that we get the farmers' views on this topic. I'm also then joined by Dr. Tafadza Mabaudi from the International Water Management Institute, uh, who is the regional representative for Southern Africa. I think uh, Dr. Mabaudi will give us a sort of international feel of, of discussion, but also ground it as well for us from the region that Emu is operating from. Then I've also got Dr. Amy Sullivan, who is joining us from the Bridgewater Consulting, who is going to be talking specifically on the key gaps and opportunities. So thank you so much for taking the time to join this discussion today. I will jump right into it, looking at our time. I want to turn to, uh, to Mary. Mary, you come from a farmers um, organization, and I wonder if maybe as we begin these discussions, you can tell us a bit about how can grassroots irrigation be improved to foster resilience of farmers? Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, as uh, they have introduced me, I'm uh, Mary Sakala, a small scale farmer from uh, Zambia coming from Eastern Southern Africa, uh, small scale farmers, as well as Rural Women's Assembly, Zambia. Yeah. Um, um, small scale holder irrigation can help us a lot uh, because it is, uh, 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 it helps in uh, producing all farm, uh, it helps us in all farm activities, especially in Southern Africa, where we only have one rain season. And uh, this acts as uh, a climate uh, resilience uh, uh, activity where farmers can have uh, food and nutrition as well as income. So uh, for now, uh, the irrigation is one of uh, the best uh, activity that farmers can do, despite it having a negative and positive impact. So I'll talk a bit of uh, uh, challenges uh, so that as we want to tra uh, uh, transform or transition to uh, smallholder irrigations, we put into consideration the challenges that are there in the small irrigation. One of the challenges is that uh, when you utilize uh, the waters, uh, the water sources uh, carelessly, you'll find that there's increased evaporation. The dams will end up uh, drying. I am talking as uh, a farmer and uh, from an experience, we have a dam in our area. I got married in 1970, this dam has never dried, but immediately people started getting into irrigation by using uh, water pumps. Last year, the dam dried totally and uh, the species, the fish that was there was uh, died all of it. So it is one of the risks and the challenges that we can have. And, uh, you find that the rivers have also dried because no. these people use the pump and just flood anyhow. So we we'll have reduced the species, as I said, and uh, we we'll also reduce the discharge to, to the sea. So it also has environmental impacts. As long as these water sources are not well managed, you find that irrigation will be lim limited. Then uh, despite of having uh, the challenges, we still have opportunities. As long as we use agroecology, you find that water tables will be rising. We we'll also have wetlands because if we utilize uh, our water sources very well, the, water, uh, the wetlands will continue to be there. If we cut trees, 
the way people are doing it now as they are irrigating, the water tables would go lower. But if we use agroecology, do the mulching, water management, you'll find that uh, our irrigation systems will be, will be managed very well. So we also need trainings so that uh, whoever has a water source uh, that can help them in the irrigation, uh, they should be able to manage that water source very well. And uh, the types of irrigation that they are doing is, uh, is uh, using their water pumps, using their sprinklers. Uh, the only sustainable way is only where they use the drip irrigation, whereby in an acre, uh, you can you utilize two to 20 liters per hour in an acre. But how many of the farmers do have those drip uh, 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 pipes or how many farmers or women farmers use the drip irrigation? So we have an opportunity of producing more. We have an opportunity to reduce dependency on food. We have an opportunity to get our own income, to take our children to school. But how can we do that? Because water harvest is something that is usually said, but not implemented. Immediately you have a heavy downfall, the water will just go to waste. Women and the smallholder farmers do not have funds uh, to, to come up with a simple or tanks for water harvest uh, uh, technologies. So we need all that, that, we need funding, we need trainings, we need technologies that are sustainable, not the current one that I'm seeing in the community, which have negative impacts. We have opportunities to improve, we have opportunities to feed our family by using irrigation, but how do we do it? Because the farmers that we have currently, especially women, do not have funds and they do not have knowledge on how to use it. We used to use our indigenous knowledge, but nowadays it's like put by the corner. So everything is turning into a mess. How do we bring that into being an opportunity? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Some very interesting points that you, that you raised. I mean, starting from the last one on the issue of indigenous knowledge, I know that the IPCC report, um, the adaptation uh, report that came out earlier this year, said one of the sort of things that we need to get back to uh, as we try to address the, the challenges of climate change is making sure that we also integrate indigenous knowledge to the sort of mainstream scientific knowledge that's there. Because ultimately at the ground, what really works is what the farmers know. And how do we make sure that we harvest that and uh, we, we utilize that knowledge? So some interesting points that you raised here um, around the inefficient use of water resources and the need to be able to sort of adopt some climate smart um, irrigation practices that can help with uh, making sure that farmers are utilizing water sources efficiently. Another point that you raised that I thought was interesting was around capacity building. So you're saying that we're not going to just introduce those technologies, but we need to make sure that the farmers actually are trained or they, they are given the sort of skills that they would need to be able to manage their water sources um, efficiently. Um, when, when you introduced yourself, you included the fact that you are also the Zambia uh, representative on the Rural Women's Assembly. And I found myself asking, um, you know, when, when we're talking about irrigation and, and, and transforming smallholder irrigation schemes, um, are there some important gender considerations that we need to keep front and center? Are there things or are there certain challenges that are peculiar to women farmers um, as compared to their male counterparts? Do you want to comment on that quickly before I move on to the next speaker? Yeah, as we all know the culture of uh, Africa, usually the women are the ones who look for water. They are the ones who look for vegetables. So as long as we don't have water, women are the most affected. 
they will go and fetch water very far. You find that the same sources that are irrigating are the same sources uh, for, for, for the water uh, for the households. So it is, uh, we don't have specifications of saying, this is a water source for drinking. This is a water source for animals. For us as Africans, the same water source can be utilized in different ways. So we also need clean water. Sometimes you find the same dam is where the same animals are getting water, goats and whatever. That water is not even clean. So that is the challenge that women face. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, really, women as caregivers, women as you know, right in the middle of business and uh, being responsible for um, you know for for the farming activities. Thank you for raising those points. Let me move right now to our next uh, panelist that we have on the line, uh, Dr. Ma Baudi from the International Water Management Institute. Um, Dr. Mabaudi, I think for you, maybe, I, I know you'll probably have vast experience working in the region and, and perhaps coming from, from Imwe, there's also a lot of interesting cases that you can share internationally on, on, on sustainable uh, water management. But what I want to hear from you is what can we do to make our irrigation ambitions a reality and build resilience at farming, at farming level? We have heard about, um, you know, the sort of Maputo Declaration, CADEP, uh, Malabo Declaration and everything, where our heads of states of government, our ministers, they sign up on these big commitments where they want to expand land under irrigation and they want to, you know, to, to just modernize uh, and transform our farming system. What can we do to make sure that some of these ambitions, including specifically those on, on irrigation, can be achieved. Dr. Mabaudi, over to you. Um, Tembi, it seems like we have not Dr. Mabaudi here. Um, oh, okay. This is Okay, maybe he has struggled. I saw him earlier on. Uh, let me move on. Maybe I can I can come to Dr. Sullivan, who is also on the line. Please confirm she's on the line. I saw her earlier. Yeah, Tembi, I'm here. Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. Welcome. Um, I think um, I mean you had my question to to Dr. Mabaudi, but maybe perhaps to you. Um, I was interested more in, in what are the key gaps and opportunities uh, in transforming smallholder irrigation schemes. You have been working on the continent for a while now on, on irrigation issues, on water issues. From your experience and from your line of work, what do you see as some of the key gaps and, and opportunities? Thanks, Tembi, and thank you colleagues for, for your inputs so far. Um, Tembi, the challenges are, are very well laid out, right? The, our previous speaker who speaks from the point of view of a farmer has, has very specific challenges in mind in a certain place. Um, Andre's work with ACIAR has, has managed to kind of link the higher and lower levels, but, but that probably is the biggest challenge. So we've got a few key challenges, I think, and these are broader. One is we tend to work on short-term solutions to what are long-term challenges, especially now when we're talking about climate resilience and we're talking about investing in um, the kind of capacity buffers uh, that communities and individuals are gonna need. Another challenge is complex livelihood systems, right? They're characterized by diversity, by uncertainty, by inequality, uh, you know, insecure land tenure, different motivations and goals. So we don't have a one size fits all approach. We have to understand local realities and those are dynamic as well. I think we've long emphasized technology driven solutions to what in many cases are social or cultural issues. Um, when in fact they are very complex systems issues as Andre's presentation pointed out initially. And then I think what also goes undescribed or unaddressed is 
it's really a complex policy arena. We're trying to demand, we're trying to balance shifting in complex policy demands and competing demands. Think about water resources, for example. Here in South Africa, you've got mining, you've got tourism, you've got agriculture, you've got ecology, you've got private sector. Um, so, so those are, are serious challenges that we face. I think to speak directly to the, the example that was just given, um, I think one of the key, the key gaps and opportunities, as Andre said too, was matching solutions to local systems and use approaches that emphasize local knowledge. And whether that's indigenous knowledge, whether it's networks and communities, uh, invest in that and emphasize it. I think we've got to address the risk issue. Uh, typically smallholder irrigation farmers bear a tremendous amount of risk right, from water availability to markets, to labor, to everything. And if we can think about how to shift or share some of those risks, bring in the private sector, talk more about insurance, um, better integration with markets, some of these may be mechanisms to help share some of the risk. And then I think scaling is critical. And this was mentioned, I think, in the opening. Um, there's a push and a pull from the top. You can try to push technologies uh, and there will be some successes. But I think if we invest more heavily at local level and certainly invest in learning, uh, farmers are very, very good teachers and they're eager learners when they see something successful. I think that probably um, has been under, under emphasized and Andre didn't mention it, but, but the work that, that the team has presented today um, is not new. It's new. It's new findings. But this work has built on um, consistent long-term investment in learning about these. So commit to a 10-year time horizon from a, a program or investment point of view. Um, emphasize learning and invest in it, pay for it. Uh, farmers are the best teachers there are. So help them understand these systems in ways they can easily explain them to those around them for success. And then my personal, um, <laughs> my personal salt box and this, or salt box, this goes to the previous speaker as well. Invest in multiple use systems, right? We can put an irrigation canal and infrastructure in and call it irrigation water. But if I don't have water for cooking, it becomes water for cooking as soon as I access it. So go ahead and address the reality that these local systems are going to be meeting multiple expectations and they will have multiple uses one way or another, right? Either legally, illegally, sanctioned or not. Um, and I think if, if we can begin to understand the roles that these smallholder irrigation systems and schemes play in local livelihoods, I think the better we understand that, the better the systems are going to function and the better they function, I think then it, it's the feedback loops. We can invest more in them, certainly in terms of time and money, and that should help ensure more resilience and sustainability. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for that intervention. Some interesting points um, that you, you raised. I like the fact that you, you, I think you sort of made a strong call for the need to invest in multiple use systems, right? Because you, you, you spoke about the sort of complex um, dynamics of uh, rural livelihoods or livelihoods in, in general. And uh, I think your point of, uh, you know, if, if, if I don't have cooking water, but there's irrigation water, I'll definitely use that water for cooking. It's something that also Mary spoke about when she was talking about the sort of um, multiple roles that um, women play uh, in, the, in their homes and the community. And um, I'm wondering, um, since we have a bit of time, I'm not seeing Dr. Mabaudi. Amy, if I can, if I can come back to you 
on um, on the issue of bringing in private sector. So that's that's another point that you mentioned to say that we need to bring in private sector. But um, for the longest time, um, I mean, even here we are talking about smallholder irrigation schemes, right? But when we're talking about private sector, we're talking about big business. We are talking about re reliability of supply. We're talking about making sure that even the quality of um, uh, the crops that are produced uh, meets the standard of say, uh, your, 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 your pick and pay here in South Africa, or you know your, your other sort of um, supermarkets or van, uh, private sector entities that would want to acquire uh, in, in, in bulk. Do you think that um, the, the schemes that we are talking about or the schemes that are involved in the, in the project are at that level? Can they be reliable sources of supply for the private sector? There's an easy answer, and, and, and that is yes, of course they can, um, absolutely, with the caveat that there are a few things that you need to understand first from the, the system's point of view. Um, what are their primary goals? Is this for... <laughs> There's the fundamental challenge to smallholder irrigation, and that is paying to put water on crops that don't earn money, right? This is the trap that women often found themselves in in the past. It was difficult to keep irrigation schemes running without constant investment. But where does the money come from if you're growing for household food security? So we're talking about kind of climbing that ladder of commercialization, Tembi, and I think that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen farmers in Eswatini and here in South Africa and other areas, and not, not large-scale commercial, but, but kind of smaller, medium and smaller-scale commercial farmers band together, right? There are mechanisms, there are co-ops, there are all kinds of other ways to do it. One thing I would do... I think there are lessons to be learned from how things work during COVID, because we know that some farmers did extremely well with local is lacquer. People wanted locally grown food. People wanted to know where it came from, and they wanted to know that they didn't have to go to pick and pay to access it. So I'm just, there is always going to be a quality, a quantity, a contractual. These are the dynamics of producing for commercial consumption. We know that. But I really do think there are mechanisms that can help match market demands with what farmers are trying to achieve themselves. And we have to meet their goals first, right? If we're not meeting, and this goes back directly to the incentive structure conversation. If we're not meeting farmers' own goals first, then then this isn't going to continue for very long. Um, mm. I, and I'm not trying to move us back to everybody buys from the local corner, and I know that, that corporations and corporate food systems are a reality. Uh, mm. But I do think that, that we can probably do more, and this is that engagement with the mm. private sector. Right. How do we do more to, to accommodate the local small-scale producers and what they're able to contribute to the market? We don't have to have the whole burden and whole risk on the smallholder producers. Okay. All right. No, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for that. Um, let me turn now to our participants who I'm sure have got um, questions of their own. Uh, we have had a very lively discussion in the, in the chat where... Um, there have been some sort of questions following up on Andre's presentation on the sort of projects and the, the tools, and there's a whole lot of interest that's going on in the chat. I'd like to open now to anyone who's participating here who would like to ask a question. If you could please raise your hand as an indication that you would want to make an intervention, and then I can, I can come uh, to you. Uh, I would also like our panelists and Andre, the first speaker, to also be on standby to answer any questions that we will have 
Um, we're going to have a sort of 30 minute question and answer section, and hopefully we will also get to hear some experiences from other parts of Africa of uh, colleagues who are implementing um, irrigation projects. I open the floor. Kanto, you can help me with the um, with raised hands. I'm not seeing any so far. Yes, I'm not seeing any as well. Um, okay. All right, but uh, maybe uh, if we direct our attention to the chat, um, they, they, there was an interest to say to follow up with knowledge with regards to measured impact of these agreeable essential multiple interventions. I think that was coming from Samti after the presentation from, from Andre. Um, there was also um, comments around um, uh, you know, the, the research being done in more than one country, therefore addressing a diverse sort of um, uh, diverse challenges or, you know, in that diverse context. And there was a question around sustainability. Maybe uh, I can open this to the project team uh, where there was a question with regards to sustainability is the chameleon soil water sensor easily accessible cost to the farmers, what has been the feedback from the farmers in the three countries. So I know that there was some chatter going on there, but perhaps we can bring it now to the larger group for the purpose of those who have not been following the chat group. Uh, Andre, your hand is up, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself and um, yeah, and take that. Thank you, thank you, Timmy. The, the, the question about sustainability is, is always a, uh, a really interesting one, and and Jamie uh, made an attempt to to answer that. But let let me just elaborate a little bit. Uh, when you use less water and you increase the yields, uh, that in itself gives you a very good indication of of the the immediate sustainability. Uh, in many of these schemes, uh, we are producing more than double the yields on less than half the water. So, so that in itself is, is a very, very interesting uh, outcome of, of the work that we are, we are far more judicious uh, with, with our water use and the, the graphs that I presented very clearly illustrate that. But if we look at other components of sustainability, the, the, the reductions in, in the, the leaching of nutrients. Uh, and we are now working on, uh, with an extension of the grant from, from ACR, looking at quantifying these impacts uh, and essentially looking at the climate smartness by, uh, and the best and most effective way to do this without doing 20 years of research is to, is to model this. So we've, we've ran our first series of models and the results are really, really fascinating uh, that we are leaching uh, by orders of magnitude less nutrients and less nitrates into subterranean water systems. Uh, the, the risk of, of not making a yield in very dry years uh, is greatly reduced. Uh, the, number of years in which farmers with the available water can produce more than one crop in a in in a in an annual cycle is is greatly improved uh, but then also when we look at the mitigation of greenhouse gases uh, there's some very very interesting things happening there uh, and also including the amount of carbon that's that's sequestered through through this process obviously we we cannot uh, account for for everything in the future, but uh, all indications are that uh, the tools and the innovation platforms allow farmers, and I think this is the critical the critical thing here is that the adaptive capacity of farmers increases significantly, so they can begin to monitor and evaluate and make adjustments to their own production systems, and and in my mind, if if you want to talk about resilience. 
uh, the adaptive capacity and the level of self-organization that farmers can engage in is, is really critical. And I think the, the combination of interventions, uh, the socioeconomic stuff together with the, the technical stuff has, has really improved the, the capacity of farmers to make those kinds of, of uh, decisions that, that help them to, to deal with the, with the changing environment. Obviously, I mean, we can talk for, for days and days on a project that's been going on since 2013, but let me stop there and give others a chance. Yes, thank, thank, you, thanks, thanks, Andre, uh, for that intervention. Actually, on the point that um, the project has been going on since 2013, I think um, it, 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 it struck me when, um, when Amy mentioned that, um, you know, we are, we are putting out short-term solutions to what are long-term challenges. And I wonder if I can maybe perhaps bring in Veronica at this point. I don't want to bring in uh, Jamie as yet because I know he's going to sort of give a, a summary of, of the discussion at the end. But I want to bring in um, Veronica at this point to talk a bit about ACS approach to being a development partner. Um, the project has been going on, I think, for close nine years now, close to, to 10 years. Um, and, and it's rare, most project cycles are four years and five years and you know, move on to, to something else. So perhaps uh, just a comment from Veronica on the, the sort of commitment from the ACS side of things and, and how they approach um, uh, sort of, you know, is it research for development uh, side of things? Uh, I've also seen that Samti has a hand up, perhaps after Veronica's intervention, Samti, you can come in as well. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I think I think one of the things that's so special about ACR is that we're not a development donor, we're a dedicated research funder. Um, mm. And I think that makes a big difference. So we still use um, Australian um, overseas development aid funds but they're dedicated specifically toward research. That's, that's really about you know, learning what you could invest in at a, at a much bigger scale. Um, mm. we, are, we are more patient, I suppose, therefore, than um, quite a lot of other um, development donors who simply wanna see outcomes straight away. We know that these are complex problems and it, takes, it can take time and a long learning experience. Um, mm. We usually don't contract like the 10 years all up front. Um, you know, this work has been divided into multiple contract projects. And so we, we try to feel our way and learn as we go. And, and one project may be enough or, or by the end of one project, it, you know, we may realize actually there's something really critical to learn that we haven't learned and, and therefore we've got to go in the next direction. Um, but but I, I hope that answers your question. I think it's it's partly about having the dedicated focus on research. Um, Thank and you. And to understand and learn as you go rather than quickly deliver outcomes. Thank you. Yes, I think that's very unique and I think that's very much appreciated. I think um, during the interventions, another call was about, you know, investing in learning. And I think that's what exactly ACA is doing. It's not about just, you know, doing that sort of short-term solution, but it's about making sure that, you know, the complex reality that uh, we all live and work in is, is well understood. And, and that takes, you know, some investment in learning as well. So thank you for, for, for that intervention. I think let me go to Samti right now, who has a hand up. Over to you, Samti. Um, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank, thanks a lot. And thanks for the responses, everyone, to the questions. Very interesting presentations. Um, my question, and uh, just continuing the, the discussion on the science of delivery um, in relation to the work we've been recently doing with the ARA, which is on research for impact. I think there's a lot of overlaps between uh, these two ways of approaching uh, research for practice or research for impact that you have shown. So happy to continue that discussion further. Uh -huh. Secondly, um, uh, yeah. Secondly, my, my other question is with regards to an area that 
I'm personally quite passionate about and uh, have obviously been working on for a number of years, and that's ecosystem space adaptation, working with nature. So as you've spoken about the impacts of your work and working with smallholder farmers towards reducing water consumption, could you also perhaps share any technologies that are being um, implemented by yourself or researched by yourself that are examples of working with nature? Um, I can think of agroecological interventions and um, maybe working with the communities uh, of smallholder farmers towards conserving water on shared land, etc. So if you could um, share any examples around that, that would be great. Um, and back now to the chair and just to mention that my name is pronounced as Sumati. Thank you. Oh, Sumati. Oh, my apologies. My apologies no to me. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the sort of very lively question that you posed in the chat and, you know, following up right now with your intervention. Let me open up the floor now to, to Andre, perhaps, um, given that he also has an interest of the, uh, of the differences between the science of discovery and the science of delivery, uh, to speak a bit on, on, the, on the project. And I also welcome any other team members that might be participating here who want to just um, add in uh, and respond to some of those issues that uh, Sumati has, uh, um, has raised before I give it to uh, Dr. Jamie Peacock. Thank you, Tembi. And as you said, if, if any of the other team members want to chip in, just uh, unmute yourself and I don't need to dominate this discussion. Before I get to Sumati's, uh, question. Uh, I just want to reiterate something that Veronica said about the, the sequencing of this project. And, you know, as scientists in, in this sphere, we often lament the short duration of projects. Uh, but we also have to be very cognizant of the risks that donors have. So they, they're not going to give you a nine-year project or a 10-year project. So you have to ensure that you, you work very diligently to get the positive results that you need to, to uh, solicit the, the next tranche of funding. And, and ACR is, 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 is unique in this sense. I've, I've been working with on both on the My World on Crop Livestock Systems. I've had ACR giving us a second grant as, as well as in the irrigation work. But you have to make sure that there are positive returns on, on those investments. So uh, I think it's possible, but we as, as scientists and researchers also need to to ensure that we we provide the incentives for the donors to give us to give us more money. Uh, back to you, uh, Sumati. the The whole idea of of agroecology and working with nature is uh, is a very compelling argument, and. Uh, one of the first things that we started working on beyond what we promised ACR in the project was, was to look at the integration of, of crops and livestock, because on many of the irrigation schemes, people were burning crop residues and not feeding it to animals. But we know that the, the irrigators also are livestock, are livestock keepers. So, so that integration was a, was a small but, but very important step to bring uh, irrigated agriculture much closer to uh, to the rest of the farming systems, and I don't want to I don't want to go too far in in what we're planning, but but we are we are working hard in 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 the next phase of this of this work to to use irrigation systems as the cornerstones or hubs of more circular food systems in which we want to engage with nature based or agroecological uh, processes to to reduce the food miles that, that Amy uh, referred to, to generate the sort of localized, uh, more resilient food systems. Uh, so that quick answer is we've not worked directly on sort of nature-based solutions and agroecology, but in the next phase of, of the work, uh, we would really, really try and do that. I see a comment again on, on the, the science of delivery and the science of, 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 
of discovery. Yes, it's a continuum, and and we we need to, but we need to be cognizant that we cannot just apply uh, reductionist scientific knowledge into into the research and development world because there are far too many many actors and and agents and feedback mechanisms that would that would interfere with with those kinds of of findings and and yeah i i said somewhere in the in the chat that i think that uh understanding the science of delivery is is probably the next big frontier in agricultural research and development thank you timby back to you thanks andre thank you for that intervention um i wonder if there are any more contributions from the team and i will just um before I, 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 I try and maybe um, give uh, my panelists um, to say a, any few re reflections or as some takeaway messages. Um, are there any hands, Kanto? I'm not seeing the hands. Um, no, Tembi, we don't have any hands. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so let me just come back to Mary Sakala and um, Amy Sullivan uh, as I try to wrap up the, the, the panel. Uh, we, we have heard from you, Mary, on I think your strong call really was about um, improving um, water use, the efficiency of, of water use. You spoke about agroecology as possibly a solution. You also spoke about the need for capacity building and um, you, you, you mentioned some sort of more climate smart um, irrigation techniques that can be adopted. Um, before we, we, we conclude the session, Mary, I want to come back to you to ask if you have any sort of final um, uh, words or thoughts based on the discussion that we have had, but also thinking that um, in, in November, um, uh, Africa will be hosting the COP27 conference. Uh, and what are the sort of things that you believe should be prioritized in those discussions and those negotiations that will be going through? What will be the message be, what will the message be coming from farmers um, as we think about transforming smallholder irrigation schemes and also building the resilience of farming systems in Africa? Mary? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I think uh, my takeaway uh, message will be, or the takeaway message for the participants should be, how, how, do, we, how do we utilize uh, uh, the water in these times of uh, uh, climate change. In some areas, there's water logging, but mostly in southern part of Africa, there are some droughts. How do we utilize the water in a sustainable way? And uh, what technologies uh, can we share so that uh, the water is utilized in a sustainable way? And the, how do we maintain the water sources? Because most of the streams have dried up. How do we maintain the water sources? How do we continue uh, uh, letting the water flow so that uh, even the species uh, are part of our food, the species in the river like fish are part of our food. As much as we are promoting technology, what type of technology should we promote so that that sustainability continues. And uh, the last thing is uh, let's uh, bring uh, science, current science and indigenous knowledge together so that uh, we, we move together in a sustainable way. People are suffering. Some people travel kilometers to go and fetch water. Some animals are dying because of lack of water. So how do we bring everything together so that we transition in a right way? Thank you for listening. Thank, thank you, Mary, for that, um, for that call, uh, bringing everything together and working together to ensure that we transition. Thank you. Amy, let me come back to you. Um, you um, made a, a, a call for investment in multiple uh, use systems. You also spoke about investing in learning, emphasizing the importance of farmer knowledge and making sure that we incorporate that. 
you spoke also about bringing in private sector uh, and, 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 and scaling up. And, and also you, you reminded us that we are dealing with complex livelihood systems and that uh, no, uh, no one size fit all approach would not work and that we need to understand local realities and contextualize our interventions. Um, any last thoughts, word, parting shot from you, Amy? Yeah. Thanks, Tembi. Um, I think my parting shot is a little bit, it's a little bit higher level. Um, and I think it would be particularly for uh, negotiators and participants in COP27, and it's based very squarely on work here in the region in the last 20 years. And that is farmers manage land and water and labor and diversity every day. But somehow in our policies and our institutions, particularly governing bodies, we're still not there. And there's still a real disconnect uh, between water governance, water management, water policy, um, and food systems. And I think that while it can be breached or while it can be bridged um, by farmers and those on the ground, until we get institutional integration and policies that begin to speak to food, water, and ecosystems um, in an integrated way, I think we're going to continue to struggle um, and, and it's going, that struggle is going to manifest itself in farmers' fields where great water technologies are available, but maybe not to farmers or water governance priorities are very clearly known, but not to agriculture. So I think there's some room there for improvement and for investment in some cross-institutional integration and learning. Uh, for certainly from national level, but but through regional level and frankly to, to AU level. So thanks, Tembi. Thank you, Amy, for those parting shots. Um, maybe, Dr. Njo, let me hand over to you for the next uh, segment of the, of the program. I'd like to thank my panelists. I'd like to thank um, Dr. Andre Van Rien from ICRISAT, Ms. Mary Sakala, and Dr. Amy Sullivan for their interventions. And I also like to thank you, the participants for keeping the chat group alive and also for making sure that um, we have an honest and open discussion. Thank you also to Dr. Verorica for uh, her intervention and sharing ACS approach um, to development research. Over to you, Dr. Nyoni. Thanks, Tembi. Thanks so much for facilitating this uh, panel discussion. I saw that uh, Andre's hand was up. Uh, Andre, I can give you a minute or so uh, for your interventions uh, before we um, move ahead. Thank you. Uh, just a very quick one to, to Mary. Uh, I really appreciate that you're asking science for technologies and interventions, but my my learnings over the last 30 years is that farmers know a lot more than what they actually know. And, and one of the things that we do in innovation platforms is to get farmers together to try and solve their own problems. And I think that's where, that's where we need to start. It shouldn't start with science. It must start with local people on the ground. My work, both in crop livestock systems, working in goats and also in the irrigation work, if you bring 10 or 15 farmers together under the tree and you start discussing problems, the solutions that come out of those discussions are often not far from what science would do. So I'd encourage you to start there. Mm -hmm. uh, don't always look outside. You have got far more uh, capacity to deal with your own problems than what you think. And I would love to, I'd love to work with you on that sort of stuff. So I'll put my, my email in the, in the chat box. So please contact me and we can talk more because I think there's a lot of value in, in that kind of approach is let farmers try and solve their own problems using their incredible knowledge. And if there are still problems, then we deal with science. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. 
Thanks, Andre. Thanks for that intervention. Very critical. The people that are affected by the problems should be part of the, their voices need to be heard. They need to be part of the decisions that are made to address the challenges that they're faced with. I think that's one of the gaps that we have had in terms of trying to implement uh, solutions or interventions on the ground. It's that top-down approach rather than a collaborative approach. And there is an other important part also the bringing in of different partners the success that we are talking about in the implementation of the TISA project and uh, the challenges that we are seeing in terms of uh, scaling up, scaling out interventions in irrigation and making sure that we have functional irrigation systems. Uh, you will see that there is that lack of coordination in some parts. There is there is need for partnerships, collaborations to ensure that we solve these complex problems. Uh, we all need to. Uh, put in our weight in making sure that we address these challenges uh, that we are faced with as a, as a continent. Uh, and think about also the priorities of the countries that we are working, uh, that we are working with, or the, the countries within the African continent. Uh, think about the frameworks, the policy frameworks that are already in place. Amy touched on the understanding that policy environment and creating that enabling environment so that the, the at the grassroots we have uh, the, 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 the impact, the people on the grassroots benefit as well from uh, the policies that are not maybe, uh, that are comprehensive enough to address the, the challenges that we're faced with in terms of trying to build uh, resilience. Uh, for us, it's uh, the kind of, uh, processes that are in place, the kind of framework that is guiding our agriculture and uh, looking at how we, our interventions, uh, I think broadly thinking about interventions to build resilience should be uh, focusing on how to contribute uh, to those targets that we have continentally. Uh, how are we solving the issue of food? How are we solving the issue of poverty? How are we building resilience as we are discussing here? I think those are very key issues that we need to think about when our, uh, our development practitioners or as consortiums or uh, partners in trying to address uh, the challenges that we are faced with in the continent. Thank you again uh, to the panelists and uh, the session that Tembi, you have facilitated uh, so well. Uh, so now we move uh, over to uh, Jamie. Uh, Jamie is the principal investigator for our TISA project. And uh, we want to think about the next steps. We're thinking about COB. We're thinking about the future. We need to deal with the, uh, these issues and make sure that we, we're building um, uh, resilience of uh, of our food farming systems in the continent. So, Jamie, uh, what do you have as, uh, suggestions or proposals for us going into the future? Over to you. Enjoy. Thank you. And if I could just start by um, acknowledging the the Climate Development Knowledge Network for for hosting this COP twenty seven African Regional Resilient Hub. Uh, Resilience Hub, and in particular, uh, FANRAPAN, the Food and Natural Resources uh, Policy Analysis Network, uh, for facilitating this very lively discussion. It's been fantastic hearing from, uh, from Andre, uh, the great facilitation from Tembi, uh, and, and the excellent uh, inputs from Veronica, uh, Amy, and, and Mary. So we started this discussion uh, by, by talking about smallholder irrigation and the need to transform it. And I think it's worth just reflecting on why we're focused on this. And it's partly that Africa uh, is a continent that has a, a very fast growing population with a lot of rural residents and some food security challenges. Uh, and that the rising risk of, of uh, impacts from climate change and at the same time, a number in the research community have published maps like this that say, uh, here be places where water can be further exploited 
uh, through irrigation to improve food security. And so while we've uh, had many decades of irrigation development in Africa in the name of poverty reduction and food security, it hasn't always resulted in uh, reliable food production or poverty reduction. Uh, and so the question is, can doing more irrigation be, um, be climate resilient, be climate smart agriculture? Uh, and you would think that if water was well managed then and provided uh, reliably, then it would greatly help produce food in the face of climate variability and change. Uh, with, of course, the risk that more water extraction impacts on other downstream water users, be that the natural environment or cities or other water users. And so we've got this great challenge. You know, how do we transform irrigated agriculture so that it is uh, makes that genuine contribution to climate resilience, uh, to lifting people out of poverty, to supplying uh, food, sustainably into the future without detracting from uh, other water users. I think it's worth noting that the African Union does have some considerable policy commitments from African governments uh, in the uh, CADA uh, Malabo targets around agriculture. And possibly one next step could be to see how these could be implemented in a way that uh, is uh, even more climate smart uh, and coming out of COP27, uh, I wonder if there is this opportunity to further enhance these uh, targets, uh, the, the large public spending that's proposed in agriculture and in irrigation in particular, uh, to see uh, how that can be done in a more sustainable climate smart way. I think uh, our discussion uh, in the past hour and a half uh, has highlighted a number of, of key messages and lessons for next steps. Uh, these are eight that, that I took down uh, during the course of the discussion. Uh, and, and I think we started with Veronica's observation that uh, with a changing climate and in many places greater water scarcity, if water is the key problem, then better water management is the solution. Uh, and uh, Andre then went on to talk about how irrigation schemes are complex systems. Uh, he put it in the positive that multiple interventions are needed to transform these systems uh, without necessarily being explicit that many of the current programs that uh, propose single magic bullet interventions like rebuilding infrastructure are unlikely to succeed. Uh, and so he was really pointing to uh, having different complementary uh, interventions, uh, particularly supporting the capacity of, of farmers, of people, as ways to, to change these complex systems. We talked a lot, Amy talked about how uh, long-term interventions are needed to demonstrate change and sustainability. Uh, and I think it was fortunate we had the opportunity to discuss the, the TESA project, which has now been going for nine years. Uh, and so it's of the sort of longevity needed to test whether uh, these kinds of changes uh, are genuinely transformational uh, and sustainable. Um, I think all the speakers emphasised the need to invest in the capacities of people from the bottom up as much or even more than infrastructure. Uh, and you know, Mary talked about that need very much from her perspective as a leader of smallholder farmers. Uh, Veronica uh, talked about uh, that need to generate real change at the local level that was sustainable. Uh, Amy talked about it uh, and, and Andre very much emphasised that through uh, such things as providing farmers with tools and encouraging them to learn and share their learnings and uh, developing 
um, the social networks through, um, through agricultural innovation platforms. So one of the, the messages that may not have been discussed quite so explicitly tonight is that irrigation schemes can only be maintained if farming is profitable. And a, a number of governments in Africa have hindered that by requiring farmers to grow staple grain crops that are not particularly lucrative. Uh, and so have not been able to ensure that the farmers have sufficient profits to pay for scheme maintenance and to provide for um, you know, the ongoing development of these irrigation schemes. And so if we want to be climate smart, if we want to use these irrigation schemes as you know, the food producing systems of, of last resort in climate emergencies, then we really need to um, be supporting farmers to grow whatever uh, they think is most profitable at the time uh, so that these very expensive uh, agricultural infrastructure systems uh, are profitable and are maintained. So we talked a lot about uh, how farmers could be empowered with these very simple to use tools. And the tools are very beguiling. Uh, they are wonderful devices. Uh, and as Andre talked about, they really uh, captured the imagination of the farmers and freed them to, uh, to experiment and, and innovate and share their knowledge and were fantastic. Although, as I noted in the chat, uh, there was at least one irrigation scheme that, scheme that didn't use the tools and was also through the innovation platforms able to, uh, to innovate and transform their, their rice growing scheme. We, uh, Andre talked a lot about the innovation platforms and how important they are for uh, providing an opportunity for farming communities to generate their own vision, uh, identify problems and opportunities that they can control and by succeeding in uh, successfully making interventions, they generate confidence in themselves and ownership of the solutions. Uh, and so in that way, um, uh, Andre was arguing that profitable irrigation farming can be more climate resilient, uh, it can reduce poverty and it can improve uh, equity. Veronica very strongly emphasised, though, uh, this challenge that if what we're arguing for is, uh, is that local uh, communities, farmers uh, need to be supported to innovate at the local level, then uh, it raises the question of how do we rapidly scale that up to deal with uh, the enormous uh, widespread climate uh, challenges we face. And to my mind, well, I heard three, three ways in which that scaling up uh, may occur. Uh, you know, the first is that, um, the first is that uh, multiple um, agricultural systems, multiple use systems for the water infrastructure and for integrating different farming systems at that local scale uh, are ways in which those local communities can become more diverse and resilient uh, and can communicate uh, those successes uh, to neighbouring communities uh, and to uh, overarching governments. Andre emphasised a lot that, um, that the profitability of the innovations that were made uh, drove the farmers in those communities to innovate further. Uh, and uh, I would then say that that then provided or uh, put a lot of pressure back on the governments to uh, enhance their policies to be far more supportive of smallholder farmers. And so uh, there is that uh, synergistic aspect of profitable farming, uh, helping to support uh, further innovation. 
and that also putting pressure on governments uh, to, to come up with more effective uh, policies. And so in terms of the Climate Change COP, which is a meeting of national governments, uh, I guess the challenge is seeing how those national governments can come to realise that, um, that the commitments that they make in November uh, need to do these sorts of uh, things to support that commercial and market growth and the capacity of local farmers. And that's perhaps a challenge we face. Uh, I'm really delighted to be working with Fanrapan because I think Fanrapan through events like this is uh, able to engage their national government members uh, and help them think about what those new policies might be that really support these smallholder farmers. And so um, uh, in terms of uh, next steps, uh, I guess these are the, th the three things that, that I would say um, strike me as um, crucial ways in which irrigated agriculture can be more sustainable and more resilient to climate change impacts. One is enabling farmers to grow the most profitable uh, crops. Uh, that's certainly uh, an outcome that we have seen in the teaser project where farmers have changed from uh, growing grain maize to growing a variety of other crops, um, uh, green maize, um, crops that are uh, able to be uh, transported, uh, kept and transported longer like chilies uh, and garlic, uh, as well as cash crops like beans that have made their farming systems, they have made their farming systems much more profitable and enabled further innovation and reinvestment in farming. Uh, I guess the second thing I would say is that empowering irrigation organisations to manage their schemes. Uh, and in this regard, I think the Mozambique government has um, been quite a leader uh, as part of their participation in the TESA project in terms of uh, adopting new regulations and supporting the irrigation organisations, the farmer irrigation organisations, to um, think through uh, the basic um, uh, measures that are needed to sustain the irrigation scheme and its infrastructure through things like business plans and setting aside money to maintain key pieces of equipment uh, and, and having very clear uh, rules and so forth. And then lastly, uh, as Andre was alluding, um, you know, our, our thinking is that um, that the way to move forward in a climate change world where natural resources like water and land are limited is to try and generate more value from uh, the same resources and uh, looking to opportunities to support uh, farmers to do things like uh, reuse wastes uh, to add value through things like producing livestock feed and integrating irrigation schemes and uh, livestock production uh, and to look at ways of further processing agricultural products locally to, to add value in terms of um, monetary value of products sold in terms of jobs, in terms of reusing waste schemes locally and generating further jobs. Uh, and so uh, we would see uh, some of those as key opportunities for uh, a more climate resilient agricultural system. Um, I know that a number of you have been very interested in, in some of the ideas uh, that Andre has raised. Uh, and here are a couple of open access uh, documents that are available that, that talk more about uh, the TESA scheme to date. Uh, I'll post those in the chat line for those who want to copy that in just a minute. Uh, and with that, Enjo, can I thank you for facilitating a great session uh, and for um, Fanrapan for this wonderful event. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, Jamie. Thanks for those reflections and for connecting all these dots, bringing it all together uh, and um, highlighting those key aspects that um, our government uh, conference of parties should be thinking about when we're trying to build resilience, uh, that call to action. I think that's very critical. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, it's And you highlight that it's, it's a system we need to continue to think about it in a systematic manner rather than in bits and pieces because then we leave other parts of the system unattended and the solutions do not become uh, sustainable. I think that's the key message that it's one of the key messages that has been coming up. It, it's, there has to be a systematic approach to things and the thinking about the ways that can be uh, uh, managed well, uh, thinking about also uh, the uh, adding value to products. I think that's very critical in terms of building the resilience of our farming communities and our communities at large. Uh, thank you so much for those interventions. And with that, uh, it brings us to the closing. Uh, I think it has been a very exciting uh, engagement and uh, uh, would like to invite Francis uh, Halle, the director of, for um, uh, policy advocacy and communications at FANAPAN, uh, who is representing the FANAPAN CEO and head of mission to come and deliver the closing remarks. Francis, over to you. Francis, uh, please unmute uh, yourself. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, can you hear me, Joe? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. I, I am. I'm sorry, I am in a power cut and have yet to make alternative arrangements. I hope I will not uh, be bringing in a lot of uh, background music sound. Thank you for, for that. I am operating from my phone outside. This has been a, a wonderful session. And I think that uh, I, I observed it one time with 86 people on, on the platform. The, the issues that are covered here are central to us, all of us. But I would like to speak from a FANAPAN perspective. All the 86 plus people who joined the platform, I would like to thank them very much for taking the time to come here. The presenters, the speakers, and uh, the panelists. I would also like to thank the facilitators and in general, the, the, the FANAPAN uh, secretariat staff and the nodes that also participated in this. From a FANAPAN perspective, ours is to present a platform where we can discuss issues and bring the state and non-state actors to understand. And today is one of those days where we really feel that our role has been uh, fulfilled. This is the beginning of a process as we go towards COP26, COP uh, meeting in Shamil Sheikh, that this conversation does not end today. Yes, there are key tangibles. There are actions that you can pick and say, we are going to do this, but can we have this dialogue as the beginning of something that is refined, that is polished as we go towards uh, the COP? And um, I, I, I will not uh, hold you down, Fred and Joe, and the colleagues on the platform. I would like overall to say thank you very much. Thank you to the, our partners. We have made this a success. Thank you. That's it. Thank you so much, Francis, for those remarks uh, representing the Fanapan CEO. Uh, colleagues, uh, it's been a great pleasure having you here in this meeting, and uh, we want to thank once again uh, the uh, Climate Development Knowledge Network, as well as the South South North, uh, for creating this uh, opportunity for us to share uh, our perspectives on what needs to be done to build the resilience of our farming communities. And so if we can uh, have our pictures, 
our videos on for those that can and say a bye child. Uh, I think that that would be great as we attend our meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful day. Uh, we also have a session coming up after this. Uh, so it will be uh, leaving this session and joining the next. Uh, let's continue with the discussions and engagements um, across the different platforms. And it's amazing what Julia is doing with the graphic designing, I think. Uh, is, is it Sonja? Oh, sorry, Sonja. Graphic harvest, that's amazing. Uh, let's, uh, let's see that, how, how it pans out.